pop up in the waiting room. <laughs> Okay, it seems a bit stable now, so we'll get going. Um, thanks for joining us. This is the Earth Sciences and Paleobiology Interest Group. Um, this is, well, also ITG08 if you're using the codes. I'm your moderator, Holly Little. My co moderator is Danae Reed. Um, we also have Falco Glockler, Talia Kareem, Erica Krimmel joining us a little bit later, and Marika Peterson as co-organizers, and are very grateful for the tech support of Beatrice Lujan and Jocelyn Pender. The session is being recorded for later viewing. Um, I think we're planning to post all the recordings on the Tadwood YouTube channel. Um, also, please keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking to the group. So again, thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll bring your perspectives and experiences with earth science and paleo data to the discussion today. We will utilize a collaborative notes document. You can find linked here on the slide and someone will also add it to the chat. Um, for, and sorry, I lost my place. If you would like to use the document, that'd be awesome, but we understand not everybody has the ability to access Google Docs, and so we will also be using the chat function as well, so please feel free to add your questions to either place. Um, our focus today is going to be on stratigraphy, but we know that there are many topics related to earth science and paleobiology that you might have thoughts or questions on, so you'll find in the document at the bottom there's an additional question section. Um, and you can use that to add anything else and we'll try to all keep an eye on it and anyone that would like to try to answer those is welcome to, of course. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or conversing with other attendees as well. Please use this judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see our code of conduct document, which someone will hopefully add to the chat as well for more information. If things totally fail today, we will relaunch the meeting as soon as possible and you can rejoin then, but so far things have been okay. <laughs> um, so to get us started, you see at the bottom of the slide here, um, and then in the notes document, we have a couple of interactives for you. If you wouldn't mind, please adding your name to the participant list. We'd also really appreciate you adding your email if you would like to keep in touch with us after this session and remain part of the discussions of, and work of this group. There's also a welcome poll. A major focus of this group is to facilitate the use of Darwin Core and ABCD EFG standards for the disciplines of the group. As we dive into the discussion today, it'd be great to get an idea from you, our community, how you're using these standards for your own data. So if you could indicate which standards you do use or any additional notes that you'd like to share with us about that, please do. So our outline for today, will give a little overview of what the interest group is and the history of its development. Um, we'll go through updates from members of the group about parallel efforts, and then we're going to dive into a wonderful discussion about stratigraphy and the many challenges of sharing stratigraphic data. Um, and then hopefully we'll define some action items so we can improve all of that. So now I will hand it over to Danae. And I will remember to unmute myself <laughs> and welcome everybody. Um, and again, thank you, Holly, for the introduction and the overview. Um, so in this stage, I'm just going to provide a little bit of a background about uh, interest groups and their role within the taxonomic data working group or the uh, biodiversity standards group. Um, so an interest group is a, I guess, a subgrouping within TADWIG that provides a basis for members of the Tadwood community to discuss problems, strategies, methods, and approaches to employing the standards that Tadwood develops and maintains. And um, the interest groups are really focused around uh, different specializations or different uses for uh, 
TDWG standards. Um, and interest groups are mostly for coordination and discussion. If an interest group decides that there is a specific task that needs to be accomplished, then it can also form a task group. And a task group will then have a specific mandate that usually has some deliverable. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So for the Earth Sciences and Paleobiology Interest Group, or the ESP, um, this is actually a newly formed interest group that is a merger of two previously existing interest groups which have longer histories in TAGLIG. But uh, as an initial introduction, the ESP interest group um, has myself as the main convener and then a core membership that includes Falco Glockler, Holly Little, and Marika Peterson, uh, as well as Stad Bloom, Stan Bloom as the primary representative from TADWIG. But it also includes and is open to all members of the TADWIG community. We really invite anybody who has an interest in paleobiology and earth sciences to participate. Um, if you want to learn more about or see the forming documents for the interest group, like what its mandate is, um, and uh, further details, you can visit the GitHub repository, which has uh, a copy of all those documents. The GitHub repository is also our main location for basically managing the documentation and the activities of the interest group. If we go forward, so I mentioned that the interest group is a conglomeration of previously existing interest groups, primarily two, uh, and those would be the uh, EFG task group, um, which was tasked to develop a standard or an extension for geosciences to the um, access for bio, biology coll biodiversity collections data standard. So there's an ABCD interest group, which maintains the ABCD standard for biodiversity data. And that created a task group to specifically create an extension that would promote um, the standardization of geosciences data in the ABCD standard. Parallel to that, there is an interest group that really focused on the use of Darwin Core for paleobiology. Um, and that started um, more or less back in 2012. And I don't recall how, uh, how long the ABCD interest group has been going in, but probably, I think, for quite a while. And if anybody has, if Marika or Falco, if one of you has, could pipe in with a date about when that interest group started, that'd be interesting to hear. But then um, this year we decided that there was enough overlap between these two interest groups that we would merge them and create a new earth sciences and paleobiology interest group with the mandate of really exploring how to use uh, both Darwin Core and ABCD EFG uh, to record and exchange uh, standardized information about earth sciences collections, mostly fossil and geological information, as well as paleobiology occurrences, including, again, fossils. Um, so that's the main mandate of the earth sciences and paleobiology interest group. If you go to the next one, um, the earth sciences and paleobiology interest group also um, has two active task groups, one for creating the chronometric age extension, um, which is a way of uh, encoding uh, chronometric ages for occurrences. And the other, again, is the ongoing or extension for geosciences or the EFG um, task group that still exists. And so both of these are task groups um, participating with the ESP. So our general motivation is to facilitate the use of standards, including Darwin Core and ABCD EFG, which are biodiversity data standards and a to promote their use, um, not just for neontology, but also for earth sciences and paleobiology. And that includes things like geology, paleontology, paleobiology more generally, but also extends into zooarchaeology and paleoanthropology, uh, which raises some kind of interesting opportunities to incorporate archeological data in with biodiversity data. Um, establish best practices and approximate application of these standards, or appropriate application of these standards um, in the different domains in which they're employed. Um, and that includes really trying to develop some of the documentation, provide examples, and where we see necessary, um, 
uh, suggest new terms or extensions that can facilitate additional use of the standards. Um, the group also develops vocabularies and ontologies to further promote the use of these standards and uh, to kind of extend their application into other domains as well. Um, if we go on to the next one. As I mentioned, most of our work is coordinated through the GitHub repository where you'll find most of the main documents. There's also uh, in GitHub an issues list that we maintain that we use to track questions and major issues that come up. Uh, each of these issues is flagged um, with labels that allow us to track uh, what that issue is related to. And today we're gonna pay special attention to the set of issues that have been flagged over the years in relation to geological context and the recording of stratigraphic information. Oh, and I see that Marika posted that ABCD is a standard from 2005. So both these interest groups have been around for a while. Um, again, I encourage you to visit the GitHub repo because uh, it allows us to, in a distributed way and asynchronous way, track issues that come up with relation to the different terms that are available and that are applicable to paleobiology and geology. And to, uh, it's a great resource also for getting commentary and feedback on how to employ the standards. If we go to the next one, we're into updates and I'll pass it back over to Holly. Thank you. That was a good overview. Thanks. Okay. So now we are going to have updates from members of the group. Um, we have a few planned, but if you have updates from other parallel sessions from the rest of the membership that maybe doesn't have a slide in here yet, please feel free to raise your hand um, and we'll try to get those included as well. So the first is about ABCDEFG from Marika. Yes, um, maybe before starting really with the update, um, I will just um, add a comment why this is so complicated. So ABCD is a razor old standard. So it was ratified already in 2005. And um, so the current procedure of Chadwick, uh, how to ratify a standard was not available by that time. So that's uh, a bit an issue with ABCD for the moment, but we are on a good way since there is now ABCD 3.0, which will be um, ratified, I think, by the end of this year. So that's fine. Um, under um, or with ABCD, it was already also in 2007 that there was a development, well, um, the development started with for EFG. So this is uh, a couple of years ago, and I think you should have been aware that there was just recently the announcement of the public review of a e EFG. So it took us quite a while. I have to admit that I was the one uh, um, digging in, into it that uh, EFG was never submitted for ratification. And when we started with the new development of ABCD 3.0, I thought, well, we should make a um, ratification of EFG. Uh, and this was in 2017. So it took us three years, um, but hopefully um, at least the executive and also the chair agreed that we should proceed with the um, ratification process because from the um, expert review, it was quite good. And for the public review, we had just one general comment and one slide comment, which might have, well, these are some changes which might be implemented in the next version of EFG. So hopefully we can really announce the ratification of EFG in the next couple of weeks, I hope so. Let's see. Um, yeah, that's just um, regarding EFG. And I think um, I just checked the um, Google Doc and just some people are using that standard and hopefully there will be more people getting in touch with it than uh, after its ratification. Great, thank you. Next, we have updates from Falco, I think. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, my update is um, on uh, geocase and it's actually 
an update. Some of you, or hopefully most of you, know GeoCase, which is the uh, Geosciences Collection um, Access Service. Um, and in parallel to GBIF, it um, aggregates and makes available uh, collection data, especially from uh, the Earth Science um, collections, which includes the fossils, which are also um, available on GBIF because of the biodiversity component. But all those collection objects without biodiversity components are also available on GeoCase once one institution provides the data. And GeoCase is um, the, the portal which is um, uh, um, representing the, the main users of the ABCDEFG because the data is provided in, in this standard. So uh, GeoCase is um, already um, online since long time. And uh, so the CTAF Earth Science uh, um, Working Group here in Europe um, um, actually started um, since some time uh, the further development of GeoCase, which um, got up to speed since the last uh, year uh, quite nicely. And so um, the further development uh, of the user interface of the GeoCase uh, data portal towards uh, um, use cases for fossils, rocks, sediments, minerals, but also meteorites um, are um, um, currently going on. And this is divided into three uh, phases. So um, we created a roadmap that can roughly be divided into phase one, which is just the renewal of the portal, um, the, the technical basis uh, and the user interface. The second phase is on the improvement and enrichment and data harmonization. Um, and this phase is actually very relevant to the activities of the Tetric ESP group. Uh, I will come back to this just um, in a minute. The third phase is um, preparing GeoCase as an aggregator for the European um, infrastructure, DISCO, the distributed system of scientific collections. Um, so especially the second phase, the improvement and enrichment of, uh, of the data um, aggregated in the GeoCase portal um, is quite relevant because, as you might know, the extension for geosciences, the ABCD EFG, um, is well structured. Um, so data can be um, provided in a structured way, but it's still lacking in providing um, controlled vocabularies um, or suggestions for external resources in order to harmonize the data uh, when, it's, uh, um, when it gets, uh, gets aggregated in the portal. And so the activity of the TADRIC group here and uh, also today's main topic, the uh, stratigraphy, for example, uh, is really relevant for uh, the improvement and enrichment and data harmonization. So data quality uh, comes out of this activity. Next slide, please. So just as a summary, there are different activities um, actually in TADWIC that is important um, um, for the, especially the GeoCase um, activities. It's the alignment of the ABCD, EFG um, and Darwin Core. Um, so today we also had a session on the alignment of ABCD and Darwin Core. Um, there will be two sessions, two workshops on uh, Thursday and Friday on the alignment of IPT and BioCase. Uh, GeoCase uh, uses as a backend uh, um, infrastructure the BioCase infrastructure. Um, so as an interface for data provision, I won't go into detail uh, um, unless someone asks. So uh, ju I just skip the technical things here. Um, and of course, the uh, connection uh, um, of the portals from the collection management systems um, in order to provide data uh, 
to, uh, for example, GeoCase, but also GBIF um, is um, essential here. Especially when it comes to the ESP group, uh, um, so to today's session, um, as I already mentioned, um, the activities on domain-specific vocabularies uh, for better data harmonization um, is really important. Um, but also discussions on common sources, uh, so global external sources, external from the collection management systems for data enrichment, especially um, one example is the geochemical data um, that is really important for mineral uh, minerals and rock specimens. Um, and increasing uh, the global use cases and, uh, and reuse for research. Sorry for the noise in the background. <laughs> A little bit distracting here. So increasing the global use cases and uh, reuse for research uh, um, with the help of data publications and citation facilitated uh, through the um, data publication on portals like GeoCase with the help of the standards like ABCD and uh, um, Darwin Core is uh, also one of the major goals uh, that we should have in mind when we are actually working on the details like today's uh, main topic, stratigraphy, and also upcoming topics um, I'm looking forward to. So thanks, that's the end of my update. Thank you, that was great. Um, and now either Talia or Erica, please. Um, I don't think Erica's here yet. Um, okay. I think she's still at the IDIG bio thing, but she's coming. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you a quick um, update on some parallel efforts going on in the US. Um, so after the Biodiversity Next meeting last year, a handful of us started coming up with the idea um, for some workshops about georeferencing or specific paleo related kind of data things and kind of to try and reboot the IDIG bio paleo digitization working group. Um, so we decided to do a georeferencing for paleo workshop um, and trying to kind of relook at um, new georeferencing techniques, like things that had happened in the past, you know, decade in terms of techniques and, and whatnot. So we started that off um, by doing two virtual listening sessions in January to try and gather community feedback about what problems people are actually having with respect to georeferencing. And the two top answers that we got um, were that georeference data includes coordinates, but not any um, metadata, like uncertainty, for example, and that the standards for georeferencing have changed and that we have a lot of legacy georeferencing that may not meet current standards or may not be um, usable for downstream re current research needs. So based on that, um, we moved forward to hold, well, what was supposed to be um, an in-person workshop <laughs> in April, um, and then COVID happened. Um, and we quickly moved that workshop um, virtually online with the help of um, IDIG Bio. And it was um, actually really great. Um, we sort of reconfigured the workshop um, for the virtual setting, so instead of two full days. Um, we did two, day, uh, two short 90-minute sessions over the course of two days. Um, we had 52 participants from 29 institutions, um, and we had a really good mix of people at standalone museums, university collections, federal agencies, and a really wide array of um, people at different stages in their careers, which was really great. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So after that workshop, um, we still had a lot of questions left over from the listening sessions um, and a lot of questions from the workshops that people wanted to dig into um, more deeply. So we created this paleo digitization happy hour kind of thing, which actually takes place in the morning. So at least in my time zone. So um, I'm not sure it's bring your coffee, not bring your alcoholic beverage happy hour. Um, but anyway, um, so we have been hosting this on a bi-weekly basis 
Um, we have a Slack channel if anybody is interested in joining that. We also have a Google group to send out email reminders about that. Um, I see Lindsay's put the link um, in the chat to the IDIG bio page on the happy hours. Um, Holly also set up a shared Google Drive space for documents that so we've been sharing things like workflows and vocabularies. Um, you can see the past happy hours that we've done. Um, all the recordings are available if you want to watch them. So let's see. Um, what else? Um, you can see the topics that we've covered. So we had a lot of questions from the georeferencing workshop come out about public lands and sensitive localities and sharing that data, which is a really big topic in the US. Um, people also really wanted to share georeferencing resources and tools. Um, we had some really good conversations about managing georeference data in our own databases. Um, and can our databases actually accommodate the types of data we need to be recording? Um, and then we've been moving on to standards. Um, we had a really great discussion on stratigraphy, um, which I think Danae is going to talk about a little bit later in this session. Um, we've talked about um, anatomical elements and standardizing those, um, which is really important for the vert paleo community. Um, how we do citations and attributions. And then we just finished up a couple weeks talking about taxonomy and how um, how that sh the, the issues with <laughs> I'm laughing, Holly's laughing too. Um, the in today, so how taxonomy relates to the bigger world of data aggregation. So our taxonomy may be internally consistent, but then when we share that, um, we don't have any kind of paleo taxonomic authority really beyond paleobiology database. Um, and we discussed a lot of the shortcomings there um, and how we might plug into other tools like Catalog of Life or some other efforts to try and develop a more robust taxonomic backbone for um, fossil specimens, which is sorely needed. So um, if you'd like to join us, um, yeah, we can set you up on Slack and the Google group. And I don't know, Holly, anything else you want to add? Um, no, I think you covered it really well. I will say we've, in an attempt to not veer too far off the path of the ESP interest group, we have been utilizing the ESP GitHub repository to track some of these issues. Um, so we're trying to keep in sync in that way. Absolutely. And just to be clear, this isn't like just restricted to US based people. So if anybody from the world wants to join us, like, please join us. Um, I know we had at least one person from Portugal that was joining for the first um, few sessions. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, great. I real quick am going to see if anybody from collections description is here before I do this. I don't know if they were planning to attend. Uh, I, am I think Matt, Matt is here. Uh, yeah, Matt is here. I saw him. I wasn't sure who was going to be doing this. Um, yeah, so this is um, it's not so much an update, it's more of a plea for help. Um, so I don't know how many of you um, know of the collection descriptions data standard task group, um, but um, there was um, previously in 2008, there was a, a natural collections description interest group, which started working on this standard called the NCD standard um, and submitted a draft, but that never really got ratified. Um, a couple of years ago, the interest group got revived and then that turned into a task group to have another stab at getting together a collection description standard within TADWIG. So we're um, looking to put out um, that CD standard um, and also working on getting our heads around a data model or models to try and underpin it um, and doing some guidance and reference implementations. But um, we do need some help, I think, from the earth sciences community in particular. Over you on to the next slide, please. Hi. These are some of the many ways in which we need help. <laughs> um, so Basically, I, mean, I think it's like a, a few of these things. We've got quite a lot of representatives from the life sciences. Um, we've had some people from earth sciences, and certainly Marika has been um, um, quite involved in this. But we, what we would like to do is make sure that the standard that comes out is 
as useful for the earth sciences side, particularly the geological side of it, as well as the paleontology and also elements of zooarchaeology um, um, as well. We need to make sure that it fits the use cases for the earth sciences community as well as it does for the life sciences community. Um, in particular, if you, th if you think about it, all the, the conversations that you're probably going to be having today around EFG and Darwin Core, um, in many of these classes and properties are pretty much the same whether you're describing a single object in the collection or whether you're describing a group of objects. So we're trying to use the same kind of things, we're trying to reuse terms wherever we possibly can. Um, so any of the conversations you have about how best to use either of these standards or where to use them, they probably apply to our standard as well. So what we'd like to do is try and feedback that information to how we're developing our one. So um, essentially, and just to, just to keep it short, if there's anybody in this group would like to get involved in our task group as well, um, that would be fantastic. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the, the basically the more the merrier, but particularly feeding back some of these conversations that you have on how best to use these standards um, into our standard design process. Thank you. Um, and I did put in the notes document, there's a place you can add your name so Matt knows who to look for. Yes, please. Well, named <laughs> volunteers are the best kind. <laughs> Um, so now I am going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, if anyone has other updates, I see there's been activity in the chat. So I don't know if there's any questions or things to bring up. Don't be shy. Um, can I respond to a comment? Yeah, I, yeah. Do you want, or do you want to respond to that? I haven't had a chance to read the chat yet, so. Okay, I was just going to respond to um, PBDB, and if anybody else from the happy hour discussions wants to talk, to chime in about this as well. Um, so we had a, a, over the past couple of weeks, we've been discussing about, um, I don't want to say the adequacy, but the the best fit of paleobiology database to serve as the taxonomic backbone for fossil data. Um, and we've been discussing whether it might be better for um, for that taxonomy to link into other initiatives um, and not to pull directly from PBDB. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has thoughts about that. Like I see Carlos, um, and the why I mentioned this is because Carlos posted in the chat about um, Mary Apoda. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything about that and about potentially plugging into catalog of life or some other other efforts that involve both fossil and modern taxa. I see John Wichorik has his hand raised as well. My raised hand is about two other topics. So if you want to finish up on this one, I'll wait. And we don't have to talk about taxonomy now. It's just, it's on the brain and it's something we can come back and discuss later too, but. Yeah, and I um, haven't quite decided if this is appropriate or not yet, but there is a taxon names and concepts group later for some of the issues that we've come up with, not the PBDB side of things, but, um, I might go bug them, depending on what their interest group meeting is like. <laughs> I think we can switch to you now, John. Okay. Um, one of them, having just had the, the bit of discussion about georeferencing, it's worth knowing that there are three updated documents that are out for review that GBIF solicited. One is a complete rewrite of the georeferencing best practices. And the second is a new and improved and integrated georeferencing quick reference guide, which says how to put the theory into practice. And the third is an updated manual for the updated georeferencing calculator. The community review period for that is set until 
the first of November. Um, so there, I think there was mentioned that a lot of the science around georeferencing has changed. I'm not sure that's exactly true. The processes are more or less the same as they always were since the first georeferencing best practices, but the tools have improved and changed. And in these three documents, we've tried to make it more clear how to use those tools and what exactly to do instead of leaving people a little bit to their own devices and trying to figure out what a place is and what it isn't. So I can leave that topic or open it for yeah. discussion if necessary. Thank you. And I um, just added the links to those documents. I actually pulled them from one of the GitHub issues. So I hope I'm getting the right links, but I didn't want to take too long to get to them. Um, they should be DOIs the on GBIF now. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll just say that I walked in a little late, so I missed some of the updates, but um, John, we really appreciated having those documents available for that georeferencing for paleo workshop in April. And we're hoping that this um, paleo data happy hour group, or maybe a larger group composed of ESP working group members as well can, can comment on those kind of collectively so that, um, they're easy to integrate comments and they come from the paleo community as, as one voice. That would be great. Um, just a note there, the what's under review right now is not any different in, in principle, <laughs> maybe in some details or links and so on, but it's pretty much the same thing being reviewed as what you saw for your workshops. So you don't have to read it a second time with respect to that. Um, I know that the georeferencing quick reference guide, we're already going to add a, an appendix, which is specifically about how to come up with a minimum enclosing polygon and or circle. Because that, we just say, do it, but we never say exactly how to do it. And there's some places where you can cheat and do it quickly and others where it's really a bear. Great, thank you. Um, maybe we can, if people wanna, if you end up deciding you wanna continue the georeferencing discussion, possibly add some questions or things in the Google doc and hopefully we can loop back around to that. Um, John, did you have another update or was it just on the georeferencing? Yeah, the other update is on the chronometric age extension which was presented first a couple of years ago at Tadwig and has matured to the point where a task group was uh, created under this interest group uh, to actually create a standard for it. And we're at a stage now with a lot of help from Steve Baskoff to try to simplify how new term standards are created. And we're, I would say, within a week maybe of being able to present the standard for public review. So there are just a couple things left to do. One is to move all the information into a Tadwig repository under the Tadwig namespace. And the other is to adjust the script that builds a quick reference guide like the Darwin core one for the chronometric age set of terms. Um, so that will go out under the normal process for new standards review. And that should be happening pretty soon. Awesome, that's exciting that you're so close. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else have any other updates they'd like to share? If not, I think we can move to the main topic of discussion for today. Ah, Marika's raising her hand. Yeah, just more or less an announcement that I'm also looking um, for help. 
Um, under the umbrella of DISCO, so the Distributed System of Scientific Collections in Europe, we are currently consolidating use cases and user stories. They have been done under iStick, also a digitization project um, finished by the beginning of this year and also then consolidated in other disco related projects. And we are having a set of more than 160 um, use cases. So for example, as a scientist, I need this and that for doing this and that. So this is the usual structure. And um, it's my task, well, I'm leading a task in Disco Prepare where I'm trying to get more use cases for the earth sciences. We have them for collection stuff and research, but like industry and things like that are missing. So I will send an email to this group, um, at least to the ESP group and also those who signed up today, um, where I get the email addresses and you receive a, will receive an email and just you can check they are now less than 160 because um, they are just those listed which are relevant for earth science and paleo. Um, I would just ask you then to check and add any use case if you are aware of or if you know any industry, any company who might um, be interested in our collection data. So just an announcement that there will be an email. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Danae, you wanna take it over? Okay, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen with the slide presentation, we'll continue that. Great, so um, can everybody see the presentation? Yeah, all right. Uh, so for the kind of plan for the remainder of our time is to invite a discussion on um, how to share stratigraphy data and primarily using and basically geological context data more broadly um, with Darwin Core and ABCD EFG. Um, So uh, just to introduce kind of the conceptual notion of geological context, we um, in the various standards have, as we've been discussing, ways of georeferencing where an occurrence is located geographically. So on the left portion of the slide, there's a class in Darwin Core for location and similar fields, I believe in ABCD EFG for noting where on earth an occurrence um, is recorded. So that might take place with a set of coordinates or even a verbal description of a location. Um, so for instance, one of the red triangles in this map is a locality at a fossil site. Um, but at that fossil site, especially for paleobiology and geosciences generally, we want to know more details about the underlying or the context, the vertical, in a sense, context of that occurrence. So on the right, you have a, an example stratigraphic section drawn from that same location at DIK21, um, showing a stratigraphic profile um, with the depth of that uh, profile and the different units that make it up. And this is part of, in this example, part of the Hadar formation in Ethiopia. And that's broken down into subsequent members like the basal member and the CD Hakoma member and then individual beds beneath that. And so this is a pretty common, this is probably the most common use case in most paleontology that I can think of. And a similar type of use case would occur um, in archeology span as well, where you would have a geological location primarily for an excavation or an area surveyed. And that area would also have um, a set of geological features that we wanna record information about. So, 
conceptually, what we're trying to get our heads around um, or trying to share with one another is a location. So um, if we look in this geological context on the right, at the bottom, you can see a note for hominid, which is uh, a fossil that was recorded from this locality, DIK21. Um, and you can see that it fits into this vertical profile of unit. So how do we share that information? Not only, there's a lot of rich information in a profile like this, uh, and that includes um, the lithostratigraphic position of that fossil in that stratigraphic column. The sedimentary information, for instance, at the very bottom, you'll see um, a detail about how the width of the column indicates the grain size of the different sedimentary units that are there, um, whether there's clay, siltstones, sandstones, limestones, or broader things. So we want to, if possible, get access to that information as well. Additionally, the, this position ties into a broader framework which informs the chronostratigraphy of that specimen. Um, and this is, again, something we can talk about more, but the chronometric age extension, um, I think, in some ways, uh, is very useful for dates that are required from direct dating of materials, which is very common in archaeological contexts, especially younger ones. As we get into older paleobiological circumstances, we're unable in most circumstances to date specimens or occurrences directly, and we have to do it indirectly by dating the surrounding sediments. Um, and so we need ways of in which we can record the bracketed age. And that is, that is available, in, as far as I understand it, in the chronometric age extension. Um, but we want to we be able to tie that to the corresponding lithology. So there's a relationship there, um, and we need to be able to track that. And then finally, this is also in the context of a larger biostratigraphic framework where um, different fossils occur in a larger ecological community of other organisms that change through time and which have been standardized, which provides useful information. So um, just some further examples of why stratigraphic information is so important and why it's such a, obviously, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, when we talk about geological context for an occurrence, in, a, in paleobiology and zooarchaeology, this is vitally important information for um, geological, fossil, and zooarchaeological specimens. And in many cases, this information is as or more important than the occurrence itself. And just to give you an example, um, this is a small rib fragment collected from the same area that I imaged before. It's generally kind of unremarkable. We get a lot of these sort of rib fragments, but it's got two small cut marks on it. These cut marks in most archaeological circumstances would not be tremendously relevant. But the fact that this particular bone comes from sediments that are 3.42 million years old means that they're the first indication of hominid tool use in the fossil record. So the context makes this particular occurrence dramatically more important. And so recording and preserving that information and being able to share it is really important. So um, kind of drawing from earlier discussions that were in the IDIC bio sessions uh, and happy hours, um, to give this some structure, we can think about stratigraphic information in terms of the lithostratigraphic position of an occurrence and its depositional context. And that includes descriptions of the rocks in which a specimen was interred, interred sorry, and some interpretation also of what uh, those facies might represent. For instance, is this a fluviatile environment or a custrian environment and that type of information. We also need to keep track of the chronostratigraphic age related to its stratigraphic position. And again, the indirect inference about its age from the age of the different lithological units that it, a given occurrence is related to. Um, it's also so the foundation for interpretation of biostratigraphic sequences through time, which we would want to relate as well. And sometimes we have information about this and less certain information about the broader lithostratigraphic context. So you might have information about local lithology, but not know how that fits into a regional 
stratigraphic sequence and the biostrategic free might be the best clue you have for how it fits in. Finally, um, the stratigraphic or geological context informs a lot about the site formation process, which is also vital information. How did this occurrence end up being where it is? And what is the appropriate way in which it might be interpreted? And that is understanding its taphonomic history and the processes that led to that occurrence being in its current geological context. Is it native or is it autochthonous? Is it um, in place or is it found as a surface find that could have moved? Um, and these are important bits of information that we might want to track. So these are some of the key divisions of information that stratigraphy informs us about relative to an occurrence. So what, what tools do we have essentially in the existing standards in Darwin Core and ABCD EFG to capture this information? Um, in Darwin Core, the primary class for recording stratigraphic information is the um, geological context class, and that class includes 18 terms. It uh, includes one ID term, a geological context ID, which is a unique identifier to some external source describing that context, or at least identifying it. Um, or internal source, but a, a unique ID for that particular context that might also reference more detailed information. And that could be an external archive of information about it. And we can talk more about that. Um, then there's a set of terms for mostly for recording the chronostratigraphic relationship of a, a, or description of a given stratigraphic unit. Uh, and this is the classic Ian era period, epoch and age of the international stratigraphy. Um, then there are two terms for describing the biostratigraphic zones, um, and then a set of terms for describing the formal stratigraphic, lithostratigraphic names associated with a stratigraphic unit. Um, and those include the class group formation member and bed terms, and then uh, a, lithos, a term for lithostratigraphic terms. And there's, uh, I guess, one of the issues we want to raise today is um, a clear understanding of what is the intent and definition of that particular term, lithostratigraphic terms. Um, is it meant to encode or recover the chronostratigraphic um, set of terms or the chronostratigraphic context for the geology or is it meant to really encode the lithostratigraphic context? So should, should it be a set of group formation member embed information or should it be the E and era period and epochs? Um, in ABCD EFG, uh, I am admittedly less familiar with the terms that are available and these are the ones I was able to pull up quickly. Uh, would welcome um, any addition, if I'm, I apologize if I'm overlooking some terms and welcome any additional um, insights into the terms that are available. But there's a rich set of terms for describing um, the stratigraphic context and geological context, as you would expect for EFG, um, which include the, the, uh, the named stratigraphic units associated with it. Um, the geochronology or set a, cl a class in term for geochronology in terms of stratigraphic date comment. Um, a set of, a term and a set of and a structured vocabulary for describing the rock type um, and the physical characteristics of that rock. So again, um, ways of, and, and going also into the petrology, the more detailed descriptions of the actual rocks and facies that uh, an occurrence is associated with. Um, also getting again into the depositional environment, which would be the facies. Um, some taphonomically relevant categories, including post-burial transportation, again, whether something is, has been transported or not. And a set of terms for also for describing the preservation status, how well it is preserved um, or altered and whether it, if it has been displaced, also a set of terms for recording um, some inferences about its original stratigraphic position. So there's a richer and more detailed set of terms in EFG that we can draw upon to 
And I think one of the things I would also introduce into this discussion is um, successful strategies for um, merging both Darwin Core and EFT terms. Um, I'm introducing here just a, a single kind of uh, use case, and there are many potential use cases. And I think one of the other things we'd like to get out of this discussion and the group of people who are assembled here today is um, to begin or to create some system where we can share uh, use cases and draw upon those. I took one use case and looked at how it might be encoded in Darwin Core. <laughs> and this is, again, um, that same modified piece of bone that I pointed to earlier. Um, and using the Darwin Core terms, uh, there is not an associated ID value for this particular um, geological context, but it does uh, have a set of chrono, uh, a chronostratigraphic position in terms of being a Phanerozoic fossil from the Cenozoic in the Neogene. And oop, I misspelled Pliocene, typing quickly, but it's from the Pliocene epoch and in the Plakensian age or stage. Um, Ethiopia doesn't have the same detailed bio, biostratigraphic zones that are available in Europe and North America. Uh, but if it did, that's where that information would go. Um, again, we can have some uh, a discussion about what lithostratigraphic terms should contain. Um, if it's to contain the lithostratigraphic terms of group, formation, member, and bed, then if we concatenate those in a format similar to how we concatenate um, geographical information and taxonomic information. Um, in other parts of Darwin Core, then we might do something like Awash Group, Hadar Formation, CD Hakoma Member. And, um, and then again, looking at that lithostratigraphic detail, it's in the Awash Group, Hadar Formation, in a named member, formerly named member called the CD Hakoma. And then interestingly here, and this would, I'd like to hear other use cases and how people handle this situation, there is not a named bed but instead it falls between two named marker beds, which is a really common uh, phenomena, in, at least in vertebrate paleontology, you imagine other use cases in paleontology. So here the bed is simply um, defined as, or the entry is between two named marker beds. So um, maybe the first thing to point out or to, to try to tackle in this group is uh, a look at that one term in Darwin car core, which is lithostratigraphic terms. Um, it's defined as a combination of all lithostratigraphic names for the rock from which the catalog item was collected. So I guess the question is what's meant by lithostratigraphic names? Uh, and the example that's given is more of a chronostratigraphic example. So Pleistocene with a, a given stage. Um, so the example provided implies a set of chronostratigraphic names, but the, defin the definition seems to reference lithostratigraphic names. So we might look at best practices for this term and whether that example really reflects the intention of the term. So um, that's one of the things I'd like to invoke in the discussion. In addition, um, looking at the current issues in the GitHub repo related to geological context, um, and summarizing some of the issues that have been raised in the IDIG Bio Happy Hours and other communications, um, I put together this short list of topics for discussion. Um, so some of the challenges that we currently have in employing Darwin Core specifically um, is that um, the geological context information isn't currently indexed by other uh, aggregators for other occurrence data like GBIF. Um, we, currently, we definitely need uh, greater documentation and examples, uh, just um, especially for geological context. Um, the, right now, the terms that are available for sharing lithostratigraphic information seem to fo focus on formal lithostratigraphic units, that is formally named units. And there's a system, I think, for formally naming lithostratigraphic units that is at least partially analogous to the system for naming um, taxonomic units. 
So what to do when you have informally designated terms, which might be somewhat like the um, common names in taxonomy. Uh, so things like Precambrian or other informal lithostratigraphic and chronostratigraphic units, is there some way we can handle those? Um, we could use some guidance on how to handle specimens that have uncertain stratigraphic provenience um, that are either uh, oftentimes in, in paleontological and paleobiological con uh, contexts, the exact lithostratigraphic position of a fossil, especially if it's a surface collection, may not be known. You can limit it to a range of possible contexts given what's present in the basin, but the specific context may be unknown. And that leads us to the next thing, which is a big difference between in situ finds and ex situ finds. So sometimes things are unearthed, and that's much more common again in archaeology where things are actively excavated. So you can, you're generally much more confident about whether something's in place. Um, and we also need a place to record verbatim stratigraphic information. So um, similar to what we have in terms of location, um, maybe thinking of some terms that would allow us to capture um, initial verbatim descriptions of stratigraphic information or geological context, especially if they're informal. And some of those are subject to revision. So for example, in, the, in this particular example, the upper part of that sequence was renamed and so you had you'd fossils that came from the upper part of that sequence had a name that no longer is recognized. And so is there a way that we can capture the earlier name and still reference the updated data for that location? Um, and then in terms of the interest group, uh, again, actions that uh, we want to consider taking are really trying to collect use cases and enhance the documentation. And again, in terms of enhancing the documentation, we're really looking at um, maybe starting with some of these challenges. So um, I'm going to maybe start the discussion. Um, and maybe we should start with this. I don't know. Perhaps the easiest one to tackle with this is, or consider is this, what to do with lithostratigraphic terms as, as a starting point. And since we have uh, some of the uh, some people who are really familiar with Darwin Core and its history um, it would be great to hear some uh, insights about how the how this term was originally intended. So I'll open the floor to discussions. Um, and I don't know how many people we currently have in the session. Last I saw it was about 55. Uh, so hopefully that's a, a reasonable number that we can um, have one large discussion. And uh, I would just encourage people to raise their hands um, using the tool in the um, in Zoom for doing that. I can um, give a little background on how this came up just to get us started. Um, so if you look at the GitHub issue there, you'll see we had a little bit of back and forth already with some confusion. Um, because of the difference between the name of the term, the definition, and the examples. Um, and I think we've decided that the example is wrong. Um, John is here, so maybe he, he kind of answered that a little bit in the GitHub thread, um, but also to help us decide what to do about it, it might be helpful to hear from him. And we do have another question in the chat for the next topic. Sorry for the delay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. It seems to me like the examples are what's in error, and that's good news because it's an easy change. Examples are not part of the normative definition of the terms, which means they can be changed without going through a huge standards changing process. So, the way to do that is to come up with a consensus in this group on what it ought to be or what some good examples would be and submit them. And as long as you're you know, doing due diligence and that there's agreement about it, then the change can happen 
pretty much instantly without going to public review. Uh, one question, is it meant to be a um, colon separated list? If there's more than one, that's how it should be presented, yes. If you want to go further than that and do something more elaborate, like a one-to-many relationship with a particular record, you'd want to make an extension where this term had only one value in it. A related question. Sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was curious, um, are comments also part of the formal definition? Or are they, they like no examples? They no longer are. No, they're, they're no longer part of the normative definition. Okay. Thank you, John. That, that makes it easy for communities in exactly this situation to make things yeah. better without a lot of hassle. Yeah, that's great. Um, we just had a quick question in the chat, and I had this question as well. It's if it's multiple, it's pipes, right? Multiple values, you would do pipe separated. Space, pipe, space. Okay. Value, yeah. space, uh, pipe, space, value. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's meant to be the same for every Darwin core term that can take a list. Great. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Consistency. Yes. <laughs> Cool. So it sounds like we just need to come up with our new example. All right. Well, I'm proposing the example that I included here. <laughs> and I'm happy to hear other examples as well. Um, I guess the other question would be uh, whether or not the, the, you know, it probably makes sense to include this, but whether the group formation are part of the formal name. So is, uh, should it be, for instance, Awash Group, or should it just be Awash Hadar City Hakoma? Yeah, that's a question that's come up a lot when you talk about those specific terms as well, the group term, formation term, because sometimes, um, I please correct me if I'm wrong in this, but sometimes you do end up things within those terms that the formal name is not a formation, it's something else. So you would wanna know that difference, right? But I think some people feel that it's a duplication of information. <laughs> Go ahead, John. If it's any consolation, there's the exact same problem in geography. Whether to, for example, put the value of the type of administrative unit after its name when it's not even part of the name, just to be um, explicit. So a perfect example is Buenos Aires, where it's a city and it's a federal capital and it's also a province and it's also places in other countries than the one that I'm thinking of. So uh, for example, Arctos has taken uh, the stance that it should be included just to avoid any issues. And in VertNet, in the vocabularies that we build to try to standardize geography, we omit it entirely because it should be evident from the term that it goes in. It's not a very strong um, argument, though, that last one. Explicit is good, it works, but it's not strictly adherent to the definition, which is the name of the place as opposed to the type as well as the name of the place. Anyway, just so you know you're in good company. Well, standardization has always been impossible because there's no real standard definition for groups and formation. We all know what they are, but I mean, they change from state to state, right? Every state has a, has a geologic survey and they change names and they change things. There's upper member, lower member groups. Some people like certain things, some people don't like certain things. And until that's established, which <laughs> Good luck on that one. But this will always be basically an issue because you never know. I mean, forget about, let's just say things can consist over time. Even if you had that, you still lack the definition of exactly what a group and member is, right? Exactly, you know, technically. And so it's always going to be some sort of, you know, ambiguity and sort of rough edges around this before anything can be standardized. It's sort of like a chicken before the egg. Like that's got to happen before this really can happen, you know.
I've, I've tried our collections to go through USGS and try to standardize every single formation and collection. It just becomes impossible. And the paleontologists get mad at me. And <laughs> why, did you, why did you rearrange this? And it's like, well, you know, we, we got to go with something, right? We got to be consistent about something. The Castle Rock formation goes here, right? And so, but even then, it's it's complicated. Yeah, I think you have many people that can feel your pain on that one in this group. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. I just say it. So I think that brings up a really good point, though, maybe um, linking back to the need for some, like either expanding Darwin Core or in this merger of Darwin Core and EFG, you know, are there, like, we need terms, right, to like maybe put a verbatim, like, what the original, you know, collector or whatever identified as the formation or the chronostrat. Um, and then, you know, as that changes through time or as it's revised or evolves or whatever, um, that can be also recorded. Um, Verbatim is great, isn't it? It really, really does solve a lot of problems when you can put verbatim, you know, and you can sort of change it as you will. That, that makes the paleontologist happy and data people have the same time. So. And I, we've talked about this in the happy hours too, and, and part of the problem, it, it's been interesting to see, we did the screenshot experiment of getting lots of people to submit screenshots of their databases um, to see what kind of uh, data they're recording and, and in what ways. Um, and so it seems like there's a real need and desire for verbatim terms with regard to the broader geologic context. John, do you ever get concerned about verbatim sort of running away with itself, though? Because it, it's such an easy solution in many ways to sort of include a verbatim. You ever worry about sort of a runaway effect where everything becomes sort of verbatim because it solves every sort of problem? Um, so Mark put a really interesting comment in the chat, Mark Ewan. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, I am unmuted. That word? I am intrigued. <laughs> so, I mean, the idea is that you could put a, a lithostratigraphic term, like, you know, in, in Danae's, you know, example here, you could put in Hadar and say who coined it and then who made it, you know, if it bumped up to a group, you could say someone bumped up to a group and make it attached to a reference. It, there, there's always opinions about the names, just like PBDB handles opinions about taxonomic names. And wouldn't it be great to be able to see that history laid out in front of you, you know, of, of everything people have said about this name. It's the same as this other thing. It's, it's very parallel to taxonomy. There are synonyms when they cross straight line, state lines. So we mentioned that, you know, one rock unit is a group here and it's formation there and it's part of this other group there. And, It'd be nice to just see that history of, of the opinions everybody ever said about anything. If someone else wanted to handle that, we would adopt it, but <laughs> it's something we've talked about, right? It's like the right thing to do, I think, is to see all those opinions and you can agree or disagree with them, but at least they're all laid out in front of you. It sounds to me like um, there's at least uh, a consensus that um, verbatim as a, like verbatim lithostratigraphic terms as a starting point might be a good way to capture uh, some of what was the original opinion. And if it's different from what other, whatever other terms appear uh, would give you some clues about how that's changed or evolved through time and would, um, you know, again, provide a ready out. And since it's it's a bit of a, a design pattern within Darwin Core, it seems like it would make sense. We, we use it a lot. That um, it kind of raises also the, the, well, another issue that we were, we're kind of segueing naturally into, which is um, the use of that ID term and uh, what resources are out there for doing something like what Mark just proposed, that is tracking different stratigraphic units, mapping their correlations and their relationships. Um, we definitely have some resources out there for doing that, uh, like Open Context and like MacroStrat. 
If there are others, I'd be really interested to hear and learn more about them. But then another way around this particular problem of, again, clearly identifying a unit or a name that could change its name or change its level is to give it that unique identifier so that we're, it has an independent unique identifier and we're all, we always know what we're pointing to. So that disambiguation would be really helpful and what services are available for that disambiguation. Um, so I'll throw that out there if people have suggestions. Um, about the potential of using things like, obviously Macrostrat is one of the examples, or sorry, uh, Open Context is one of the examples for ID currently in Darwin Core. I think Macrostrat would be another possibility. If there are other similar services, uh, I'd be really keen to hear about them. Um, real quick, Danae, I don't know how other people feel about this, but I find when we're in the chat mode, maybe we can go back to seeing the grid. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Um, and I did add a line in the notes if people have services for what you were just talking about, they can add those to collate them. Also speak them out loud if you would like. Um, we do have a question from earlier and Ian has his hand up. So maybe Ian can go. You took your hand down, but you're muted. So I don't know if you just accidentally had your hand up or you're just muted. <laughs> Sorry, I took my hand and I forgot to unmute. Okay. <laughs> uh, the multitasking that Zoom requires. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on the verbatim terms and there's a nice discussion about verbatim terms in the GitHub issues for Darwin Core under verbatim scientific name. So someone proposed a verbatim scientific name term and it became a broader discussion about the use of verbatim terms and, and quite rightly they can proliferate. You can include a, a verbatim term for anything. And, um, and I think, I mean, my feeling about it is that verbatim terms shouldn't replace other terms or be used um, instead of other terms. Um, they should be there to support those other terms uh, so that people can go back, okay, you know, what was in these various lithostratigraphic categories or, or, or terms, individual terms that we've got compared to the, the verbatim, what was written on the specimen label or, or collector's notes or something like that. Yeah, as we were talking about the verbatim term, I was like, oh, but I want verbatim for everything. <laughs> Did Falco have his hand up? Yeah, it appears that I'm a moderator, so I don't have this button for <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. This discussion actually reminds me of what we already do uh, within ABCD when it comes to the determination history. So, um, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, I would like to uh, raise the question to the group here. Uh, would it be actually the same, um, the same case that if we had changing stratigraphic information, would that be a result of a kind of determination process? So we would just write down the history of this determination, preserve this history, um, instead of doing something um, with a new term like verbatim um, uh, stratigraphy, which could also be interpreted differently. Like, I mean, a little bit in, in this direction of informal names, or uh, when it comes to transcription of labels, then verbatim uh, of fields are always used. But this might be distinguished from a determination history of stratigraphic terms. Uh, 
Yeah, Falco, I think we had that discussion um, within the happy hour group that was brought up. And I can't remember, somebody's actually doing that maybe in the EMU database. Wasn't somebody doing that? We technically have the ability to do that, but we have some other limitations. So like at our museum, what could be a determinations history, we have to use those fields to show ranges. So we have to pick, but we do keep notes of that history. So what would be the preference of the community represented here? I'm wishing we had the ability to do polls on the fly better. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if that's a false dichotomy. So for when it comes to verbatim, the I can definitely see circumstances where uh, a, a lithostratigraphic position was named, for instance, in publication. And if you're drawing from that, um, so there is, an, a, there is a, in a sense, a printed authority, kind of like the label on a museum specimen that says, hey, this fossil came from this geological horizon that was, you know, defined in the field back in the 60s or something, or earlier, who knows, 1800s. And that subsequent kind of geological survey and analysis reveals, you know, led to a whole nother uh, a refinement of that, just like you would in a taxonomic revision. But the, still there's this authority that's associated with the publication associated with that that you'd want to capture. So in both cases, I, I guess, with regard to the, the stratigraphy, like the, that unit itself, that tracking its revision, would, it would make a lot of sense to use um, that kind of tracking infrastructure to do that. And that would be different from what's associated with the occurrence, which is its kind of label information and recognizing that its geological context, it has some verbatim geological context, which points to the stratigraphy thing. So again, the IDs seem to be, if we can utilize the IDs to, and then for each ID externally track how something's changing through time, that might be the ideal solution. And the question is what resources are out there for the ID? I don't know. We've talked about this a little bit. And I think one of the big challenges is a lot of the infrastructure for doing that doesn't exist. Yeah. I feel like Falco might have some thoughts on the seat, the content management systems infrastructure that could work for that though. <laughs> I mean, there, if, if there is no infrastructure for that, um, there are actually tools that are designed for uh, addressing these issues. Then it just comes to the question, who is going to curate this and host this kind of service? Um, but um, I mean, this this is highly related to what you already mentioned, Dini. Um, what would be the right place to to have that? Would it be the the um, uh, um, macro strut folds, or would it be maybe even close to the geocase infrastructure? Um, um, I don't know. I I would be open to that. Uh, so as as long as we have a critical mass uh, um, agreeing on that uh, on that, and the the curation of the content is kind of um, assured for the the future, um, the near future, then um, let's talk about that. And I'm sure we can find resources uh, to set things up. Maybe that leads naturally then, uh, or segues to um, the next part of the discussion, which is uh, if there, especially if there's been a f earlier discussion in Tadwick about doing the crosswalk and revising that between Darwin Core and ABCD EFG, um, what are the strategies that people have employed for mixing and matching Darwin Core and EFG? Does anybody do that? Do people stringently use one system or the other? Um, as a researcher, I don't know, I feel like I have a little bit more flexibility and maybe institutions don't, but I'm curious to hear how people might employ that kind of system. Um, I'll, I'll just go, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> I don't want to monopolize the conversation, um, but I will say just from our happy hour discussions, I think that most people in the U.S. are still using Darwin Core, and I think we've still found within the paleo community, um, there are still a lot of folks that don't really understand what Darwin Core is, um, and when we did some of our initial um, listening sessions and feedback for the georeferencing workshop that we held um, in April, there was still a lot of unfamiliarity with Darwin Core. So just to put that out there, um, I think not everyone in the community, at least in the U.S., is, is at the level to even start talking crosswalk between two different standards because they barely understand <laughs> what the standards are, maybe. So... There's some implementation issues. Yeah. I do, to, to your question also, Danae, I think there are some challenges in the infrastructures that a lot of individual institutions have to be able to support a combined usage of both. Like I know in my own institution, our mineral sciences data manager was trying to implement ABCDEFG and uh, something with geocase. And our IT was like not up for it because we already have an IPT. So why would you do that? And obviously there are reasons why you would do that. <laughs> That's actually also why I mentioned uh, in my update uh, that this, uh, these infrastructural uh, questions are quite important to, to all our discussions. So I'm really looking forward, just as a side note, to the workshop on um, aligning IPT and uh, BioCase as providing tools, uh, mapping the local databases uh, to, to the standards. So I'm really looking forward to to the outcome of, of this uh, um, uh, workshop on Thursday and Friday. But on the other hand, I can say that also the, the GeoCase community um, is uh, thinking of other ways providing uh, data to the data portal um, um, other than only with the BioCase infrastructure. So uh, why not approaching um, an uh, um, IPT-based or um, Darwin Core geological context or whatever extension-based uh, data provision to GeoCase. All these alignments are really important to to harmonize the data and and to have joint efforts in in these activities. Great. Um... We've actually covered a lot of the challenges that I mentioned in the slide. Uh, there's one more uh, quick one, and but I think we are, how are we on time? I think we're at time. Um, but one is, is also considering the introduction of the XC2 and NC2 term. So if people have strong opinions about that, uh, which is already present, I believe in EFG, but it'd be, a quick addition of, an, of another term. So two of the terms that we've talked about in potentially introducing to Darwin Core one way or another um, are the verbatim lithostratigraphic terms and possibly an in situ term to indicate whether or not uh, a specimen is in its original geological context or has been somehow transported or is not in its original context and how much detail to go into with that. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe that's something to continue thinking about. And I want to encourage people to, to contribute to the online Google Doc. We still have 30 minutes. Oh, oh, good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, yeah, I, maybe I'll open that up too and, and ask. And one of the other things that raises for me when we talk about ABCD in relation to Darwin Core is um, the you know some of the challenges I've had in in working with both is the nested structure of ABCD EFG as as XML um, or how it's presented that that nested structure and the more flat structure of Darwin Core. Um, so in when you've done those crosswalks, how does that, how is that handled? Mm -hmm. 
Do we have people here that have participated in that? <laughs> All right, so that's, <laughs> I'm wondering if the, you know, I guess maybe some of the enclosing um, units in, in EFG basically serve like classes, but because there's a nested hierarchy, it makes it a little harder to do direct comparisons. Um, there, in the crosswalk that does exist, there are indications of matches but it's like a level of match because some of them are like it's kind of a match. There's a there's a vocabulary for it. It's pretty interesting to look at, but it is kind of hard. I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. <laughs> Do people have opinions or thoughts about uh, X C two and N C two as as a potential new term? In my own. In my own database, uh, I use uh, in situ, and then I use a variety of terms for how close they are to being in situ, including things like grab, where someone has just gone out and grabbed a sample from a locality. There's also things that are just kind of float samples that you're nowhere close to a point on a measured section, usually someplace coming from someplace upslope from that spot. Mm -hmm. uh, rocks don't roll uphill very well. Um, so I, I just, I have a variety of terms for that. There's only three or four of those terms, but I record it. Is that common in, um, in the information that, uh, the natural history museums are recording when they accession fossils? Is that data that comes to you? Not commonly, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm getting, yeah, I have a lot of stuff uh, uh, from, we had a donation in 2000 of about a quarter million objects that came from an oil company. And that oil company recorded virtually everything uh, for biostratigraphic pur purposes. And uh, they were doing this stuff back in the 1960s and even computerizing stuff. And uh, they have some really great data. And I, as I attend these meetings and, and have gone to conferences and stuff, sometimes I think we're reinventing the wheel that was already done, you know, 50 years ago. It would be nice if the oil companies were uh willing to share some of the data collection tools that they had even back then yeah i don't have the computer code but i've got all the <laughs> stuff that goes into it so i think we may be um also like conflating two different things right so there's like the sampling protocol of in situ ex situ or you know grab float whatever but then um there's also whether something is in situ in place or reworked. So I think mm -hmm. it's important to make make those distinctions when we're recording that information to you. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, something could be recovered in situ, but then could have been transported in the past. And so having some opportunity to, to record that as well. I guess part of it is given given the intent of Darwin Core as a way of um, at least providing basic information that allows us to discover specimens, at what level uh, of detail do we need that? Um, and uh, to my thinking, at least for most of the applications that I have in mind or would be using this for, it's, it's knowing whether something was recovered um, and then probably at some later point getting into the, if I wanted to trace, track that down, figure out whether or not it had been, there was some inference about whether it had been um, transported or not. And you get, a, again, there, kind of with the description of facies as well, how much of this is interpretation and how reliable is it? So as uh, data are available um, through aggregators, 
what level of inference is tolerable in the data that's presented. Um, it's kind of another issue. Uh, we still haven't really dealt with the issue of how to get the stuff. We started onto it with, with the discussion on biocase. Um, but to what degree might geological context be included in GBIF or other aggregators? And I don't know if there's anybody here from GBIF that could speak to that, but. I can't speak to a solution, but just in case people haven't tested this. Um, so in GBIF, the geologic context fields or terms are not indexed. So if you send someone to look at your data and try have them try to discover it based on that information, they won't be able to sort through it that way. Um, in I dig bio, you can search on it a bit more. Um, I dig bio being one of the US based um, data portals, but it's uh, very specific to how you put the name in. And so that's where like what we were talking about with how, how explicit you wanna be with a term, putting, um, I am blinking on the name of any formation that I can use any, as an example. <laughs> But whether you put the word formation or not, or FM matters a lot in the way that it is discoverable there. Yes, they saved me in the chat. Yeah, there's a, a lot of discussion in the chat about the overlap of in situ, ex situ with the, the concept of sampling protocol. And, uh, and I agree with a lot of the comments. Yeah, sampling protocols where we want to distinguish things that are like screen washed and collected versus. Um, yes, every variation that's showing up there means you have to search a different thing. Right. <laughs> so that, yeah, the question would be if, if we added an in situ field, does that create more confusion about where certain bits of information should be located? And do we create more of a problem than we solve? Is there anything in, um, I guess, I mean, we could, we could argue that uh, depending on how you define the vocabulary for sampling protocol, that certain sampling protocols definitely imply in situ versus other. <laughs> so like an excavation sampling protocol would definitely imply an in situ recovery versus surface collection or floating or uh, not sure what screen washing might be, but. Uh, do we wanna move on to maybe talking about um, uncertainty? in stratigraphic provenience? Um, yeah, but real quick, there was a question very okay. early on that we never quite got back to, and we may have covered it, but I, as my moderator role, feel that I should go back to it. Um, so Paul Morse, almost an hour ago, asked us, how can we handle the nature of formal stratigraphic units as hypotheses, which change over time? They are very like taxonomy and having a formal code of nomenclature types synon synonyms and changes in scope of a unit over time. I feel like we did slightly cover that with our determination history discussion, but I just want to make sure he doesn't have any other points about it. If he's still here, I don't know. I'm not sure he's still here, Holly. <sighs> Failure on my part. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next thing. Then. <laughs> okay, we do have this question about whether or not we, uh, we as a group, as an interest group, could engage with GBF to ask them to index um, these particular terms. Um, and I have no idea what the formal process is for that, but it sounds like it would be a good idea. Is there a reason but they don't is. index them? I don't know, but I did add that to the action items. Okay. I just decided we're going to do it. Great. We can just do it. Yeah, that sounds good. 
<laughs> um, to make use of that indexing, then uh, we, you know, we we would want to strongly encourage then that anything that goes into, especially the lithostratigraphic fields like uh, group formation, member embed, would employ some sort of structured vocabulary, um, and that you would want to. Uh, make this as consistent as possible. But how to do that alignment, again, we're back to um, that challenge we talked about before where having an ID might help you do that alignment better than um, even the structured vocabulary where it would because there's not a whole lot of consistency with the vocabulary. Um, but even within a data set, it would at least let you pull some things out. When things are indexed, um, do they do they do general text searches? Um, in the sense, like if something was entered as Willwood formation and or something else was entered as just Willwood, would it would both those records be recovered from sort of a query in GBIF? Seems that everyone is trying that just on, on the GBIF portal. <laughs> I think it's, it's also kind of important for us to just remember that, you know, what's possible on GBIF now is just what they've come up with so far. And so maybe we don't, you know, we can always ask for more and that's not really the limitation so much as, you know, are the standards working for us? And if we're following the standards, then can we force GBIF to comply with making those standards um, discoverable? I was, I was just adding, and uh, I agree with you. And this is Mark, by the way, Mark Ewing. I, I was saying in the chat that basically like on, on P paleobiology databases input, you, you can tell the database that such a unit is a group or a formation or a, or a member. But then when you go to download data, it just sort of ignores that information. And if you put in a name like Willwood, it'll, it'll spit it back out, whether someone said it was Willwood group formation, that it doesn't matter. And that, that seems to work pretty good because if you're interested in the Willwood, you don't care whether some previous author called it a formation or a member or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, we're concerned about data, so we should keep that as much specificity as we specificity as we can when we store it. But then, when we retrieve it, we should sort of be more generous in our data returns. Today, it was Over. mentioned in a in a um, in a session. Uh, Tim Robertson from GBIF mentioned that there is always three representations of the data um, on GBIF. So that's the the um, the kind of cleaned data um, checked against their uh, um, um, registries like taxonomic uh, catalog backbone and so on. Um, then there's always, and that's the most important one, um, the, the raw data available. So, and I just briefly checked one of the um, records of my institution and although certain uh, elements um, are not indexed and not shown and so not searchable on, on GBIF, at least the raw record contains the, the provided data or the additional elements. So if there are ways, I'm, I'm not sure, um, to also download the raw data uh, after a search, then um, there would be at least um, the possibility to reuse the data, um, although it's not indexed. Mm -hmm. So we have about 15 minutes left, which 
this is a decent amount of time, but I didn't know if we want, so we've brought up a lot of issues and I think we all have a lot of really good ideas of things we might want to do with some of these. Um, but something that has come up um, some before this and in the chat now is the idea of doing use cases exercise. And if that's something we want to do, we probably need to spend some time talking through what that looks like. I feel like if we can come up with some structure to put these into, even just having people write out what they think of how they map their data to some of these terms and then where their gaps are would be nice. I don't have a lot of experience with doing these cases though. I think one, one idea we floated then was um, putting up a Google Sheet and um, just across the columns having the various Darwin Core and ABCD EFG terms. I mean, um, and then asking people, you had to take, for, add one or two records of different use cases and how, what values they would provide for each of these terms as the rows in that spreadsheet and um, kind of look at some of the variation, but basically sort of, you know, uh, source use cases from the community um, for examples. That would be one way to do it. Maybe if people would be up for interested in doing that, can you use the yes button in Our participant <laughs> list? <laughs> oh, there's a yes button. Okay. Yeah. As long as there's only not only a couple of us, then I think it's good. But we have five. <laughs> I can't find the yes oh, button. Yes, there you go. It's at the bottom of the participants list if you open that window. Some people that are co hosts, I don't know. We are, we can indicate, it. yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just being technically challenged. <laughs> Related to that, to anyone that indicated interest in our paleo data working group happy hour group slack channel thing sorry i refer to it in many ways um, we have a lot of shared resources to get at some of these authority issues that have come up and just what the sources are that we use for this data um, so perhaps we'll send an email and you're welcome to add to those lists So we have 12 out of 49, I guess. <laughs> so we, we would expect then in the, in, the, um, in the spreadsheet at least 12 examples. Maybe we can double that to 24 if everybody can enter two different extreme use cases. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to see too, um, I, I, could, I could definitely see plenty of paleontology use cases from this community. I'm curious if there are if there's anybody who'd be able to provide Zoark use cases, um, which, which might be, you know, if there's going to be a challenge in the difference of thinking about stratigraphy, part of it I could imagine is the difference between people who do surface collection versus excavation. Just the methods are so different and the stratigraphy in caves and rock shelters and stuff tends to be quite different. So you're not going to have the formal, you're not going to have any of the formal units in a cave, it's all going to be all informal stratigraphy. <laughs> it's, it's, all gone it's like integrating paleo taxonomy with like, you know, fish when they like, you know, paleo body <laughs> skips, from like phylum to like genus. And like, what do you do? Like, there's no hierarchy anymore, you know? The, the hope is that there is still stratigraphy. <laughs> so there is still, there are still units. The law of superposition is still in effect. Exactly. Gravity <laughs> still applies. And they are, they are defined. They usually are very well defined for most excavations, actually kind of better than most paleontology. <laughs> they really do an excellent job documenting them. They're just locally documented. So they're not, they're not as extensive. But um, in that sense, 
you might ask how useful is that because two different caves <laughs> are not going to share the same stratigraphy. You're not going to search by that. But within a data set, knowing that information would be critically important. So anyway, it's worth exploring as a use case to see what people come up with. At one point we got higher, but now we've gone down. <laughs> <laughs> Once I mentioned that, everybody, no, no, I don't want to be part of that mess. <laughs> And I guess the other people, uh -huh. oh, people might be more willing to participate once we kind of sketch out more of what what helping with the use case looks like. Yeah, that makes sense. They don't want to commit yet. <laughs> Give us an example. <laughs> Give us something to look at. <laughs> Um, well, that brings up a good thing. So um, in the notes document, we asked that you add your email if you want to be included in an email list for all of this and stay connected with the group. Um, so I'm just going to say that again in case anyone has changed their mind <laughs> or wants to go back and add their email because um, hopefully you will be hearing from us about these use cases and some other things. Yeah, we, we were talking to that, um, we, we've talked about doing use cases before for applications of Darwin Core generally to paleo data. Um, but when you're looking at entering use case data for like an entire Darwin Core record with 200 terms, that's kind of daunting. Um, so kind of doing these more targeted uh, explorations of UK use cases for specific classes, hopefully it would be a better way to make progress on some of these. Um, uncertainty in some of the use cases would be another good one to explore. So what do you do when you have stuff that's as an uncertain context? Yeah, I'm really curious about those gaps because I think we have, we obviously need some guidelines for some of these terms for the ones that exist, but I think a bigger, a big part of this is that we have a lot of gaps. Um, and this puts a lot of weight on only a few people in the room, but having anyone that's really familiar with ABCDEFG look at the use cases and being able to identify like, oh, well, that would have fit with this term in ABCDEFG, that would be really helpful. <laughs> um, is it, has the documentation for ABCDEFG changed at all? Or does it, is it remain primarily the XML file and the schema? Um, is there a similar human searchable um, web interface for ABCD EFG terms the way there is for Darwin Core terms? Yes, it's the Tedwig terms wiki. Uh, I posted a link uh, already, but I can uh, just repost that. Excellent. Um, and this has been transferred from the um, XML files um, in the uh, um, process of designing the ABCD 3.0. So there is still some more refinement in the documentation of especially the EFG uh, needed, but um, it's much more um, human readable compared to to the long document um, you, you know from, from past years. Great. I think your cat wants attention. Yeah, I, I shoot her outside. So now she's like, let me back in. I did that to my cat one time in all quarantine and he yelled for the entire hour that he was shut up. <laughs> Great. Are there, um, we should maybe use the last few minutes. Um, we've introduced just to summarize some of the things that we talked about. Um, we talked about the challenge of how to get uh, geological context and stratigraphic information indexed by the aggregators. Um, we talked about how to continue developing the documentation and especially the use cases as examples of how we might deploy these things. I'll mention also that 
the document we're generating now from this discussion, um, I'd like to see actually uh, kind of reworked into some sort of um, summary document uh, to add to the Tadwood documentation um, and perhaps something we can publish um, and to try to develop some sort of annual process of collectively developing the documentation um, every year as we have these group meetings. Um, so maybe we can get into that as a rhythm for improving the documentation, which will hopefully expand the um, consistency with which Darwin Core is, is deployed and ABCDEFG as well. Uh, we have talked about um, the possibility of introducing verbatim terms for for storing informal stratigraphic and geological context information and original documented stratigraphic and um, geological context information. So I think that's something we should consider more carefully going forward and maybe advance. It seems like there was a pretty good consensus that that would at least be helpful. Um, and we introduced the idea of using in situ x c2 and maybe we could explore that in the use cases and see how that might it, try to use it and see if that creates problems or confusion with um, collection method but uh, at least take a crack at that are there any other ideas or issues that we haven't addressed that people want to propose I did a bad job of bringing my own thing up, but I put it in the document. So um, I added a note at the bottom about taphonomy. And if anyone yeah. has any response to that, I'd, you can add it after this. We obviously can't talk about it now, but I heard it was a hot topic during the how did it die session earlier today. Uh, what happened in that session? Was there a, did we used to have a set of taphonomy terms in Darwin Core? I think it was if it's within scope or not for that group. Oh, as okay. they, as, cause they're working on a new extension maybe. Okay, cool. Well, thank you everyone for participating and it was great to see so many people present. And um, if you have suggestions too about uh, topics that we should cover in future meetings for Tadwig for this interest group, um, please add that to the document as well. It'd be great to hear those suggestions. Um, I could see going forward talking more about anatomical element or, and um, taxonomy, which are continue to be thorny and difficult issues. So, but always open to other ideas as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.